Good evening. Welcome everyone to a series of video conversations with eminent lawyers with Bahura. Bahura is India's largest legal recruitment and consulting firm. I am Anish Patnaik. I lead the litigation consulting division for Bahura. To kick off our series of conversations, we are talking to India's top counsel, Dr. Abhishek Singhvi. Dr. Singhvi is a senior three-term sitting MP. He's a former chairman, Parliamentary Standing Committee on Law and Justice. He was India's youngest designated senior advocate at 34, also India's youngest appointed additional solicitor general at 37 in 1997. He is a very well-known author and columnist with a visible media personality. He is also the senior most serving national spokesperson of the Congress party. His com columns have appeared in India's two top English dailies and have been published as two books titled Candid Corner and Straight Talk, both with forewords written by Dr. Manmohan Singh. He is also an occasional columnist in major Hindi dailies, the Dainik Bhaskar and the Rajasthan Patrika, awarded the Global Leader for Tomorrow Award by the World Economic Forum at Davos in 1999. Dr. Singhvi has been the opening lead speaker for the Treasury Congress benches in Parliament for almost every major debate from 2006 to 2013. He has been the common factor in almost all landmark Supreme Court cases spanning constitutional law, corporate law, and arbitration, amongst most other subjects. He supports many charities, including the Prayer Center for Destitute Children and uh, the Singhvi Scholarship at Trinity College, Cambridge. This, apart from the sterling work done by him over the last 12 years in Rajasthan from his MP LAD funds, supporting 400 projects in the field of health and education. Dr. Singhvi topped India at the school leaving Indian school certificate exam and did his BA economics honors from St. Stephen's College and his MA and PhD from Trinity College, Cambridge, UK. He also taught at St. John's College, Cambridge and did a brief summer program called PIL from Harvard in the USA. Dr. Singhvi is my first and foremost boss, my guru, my mentor. Sir, thank you for joining us on this conversation. Thank you for your time. Thank you for a very generous introduction, Anish. Uh, I'm not sure I deserve it, but thank you nevertheless. No, sir. Anything I say is very less. And, you know, the time that I've spent in your chamber has made me everything that I am today. It's something that I always share with all my colleagues and friends and uh, everyone that I meet. So thank you for all the mentoring, sir. And thank you for continuing to be a part of my life. I'm ever so grateful. Uh, so to start with, I, you know, I thought we could take this time. Uh, so why did you choose to be a lawyer? You're, as the son of, uh, you know, late Sri L.M. Singhvi, a stalwart of his time, was that your natural choice or uh, was that something you picked later in life? I, I think uh, if you use the word choose, there's no such deliberate conscious moment of life when you choose something in most cases. And I think this is possibly a, Reminder and lesson to others also, younger and older. Uh, as it happened in my case, first and foremost, you grow up in the sounds, smells, sights, um, goings and comings of the law. From childhood or from early childhood, uh, teens, you see the, you know, the usual jargon, the dresses. So there is a, what I might call an ambience of law, a culture of law. It's like saying very much that there is a, Similar ambience in the doctors, a similar ambience in the architects. Number two, having said that, it should never be, and I think the best choices are made if it is never even semi forced conclusion. So I'm a doctor, I force myself on my children to become doctors, would be the wrong way of going about it. There is automatically a subconscious ambience, and to the extent they are influenced and imbibe it, they will, there will be what one might call an initial presumption or an initial. Uh, inclination. Number three, suppose in a hypothetical case after the initial inclination, you don't like it. Or you say, look, I want to be a fighter pilot or I want to be a uh, singer. I think you need to just you know, applaud that choice and uh, cherish it and give it the push you can with the resources you have. Lastly, in my case, happily, no such dilemma occurred because the ambience and the, the noises and, you know, sounds of law around me. And my grandfather also had been a lawyer, although he died before I was born. And my father had been a lawyer for many decades. So it was, uh, it, it just kind of became, but to be honest, these choices are a choice of uh, elimination process. 
you think of X and then you ruminate and you say, no, not really. I don't quite like that. Then you think of Y and you say, no. Then you say, okay, of all these ABC I've thought of, XYZ I've thought of, the best is A. And then you come to it by a process of elimination. It's not so much a positive as a negative choice. But uh, having said that, I must tell you a very uh, delightful reason which my mother, more than my father, by the way, was a lawyer, insisted that I should become a lawyer. The only person who, without any um, hesitation, pushed me into law. Uh, not that I you know, would have got pushed if I had not wanted to go myself, but she did. It was a very delightful reason. She said, what will happen to all the library and the law books if you don't take law? What a sheer waste. So that was a compelling and answerable argument. And uh, ultimately, I think it happened because there was no overt pressure from my father. Because there is a very tangible manner and way in which you develop a dislike. Even for something you like, if it is rammed down your throat. And in my case, I was fortunate. My father, who had every right to do so, being so much a person of law, never even remember, if at all, he was less insistent than my mother. And uh, I think it all worked well. But these are different examples I gave because a different example and a paradigm would apply to a different person. But this is the way it is. Thank you, sir. Sir, around the time that you were joining the profession, India was also getting more corporatized. Uh, you know, the economy was also opening up slowly and there were small buckets of corporate firms. Uh, but you chose to join litigation. Was, uh, was corporate law ever in your realm of consideration? Did you think about it? Not corporate law, except in a litigation sense. Uh, you know, let me share with you, I, uh, first of all, I embarked after my law degrees, which were also at Trinity Cambridge. In those days, they were directly recognizable without a bridge course as now. Uh, and uh, I embarked on a PhD. Now, everyone, including my father, who was a PhD from uh, was a LLM from Harvard and a PhD from Cornell and a member of the Berkeley faculty for a while, uh, virtually said that it's a very foolish decision to take and you should join the law as soon as you can because you're wasting time. What's the use of a PhD in law? And uh, those were very traumatic years because I embarked on a PhD in Cambridge. The average time period for finishing a PhD in actual fact is six years and again they stipulated three years. And 50% of those who embark abandon it midway. Of those who complete it, they take six years. It's a very lonely para, unlike the US, where there is no supervision for PhDs in India. So you have served out, then you have this insecurity that, uh, especially your father saying that, look, the professional valuable time is going away, you should be joining it. And you see others who have not done PhD uh, doing the profession, and then you also think that no, there will be hardly any direct benefit. So those were difficult times, and I, therefore, after and during the last part of my PhD, was supplementing my income by doing supervisions, which is what tutorials are called in Cambridge. Uh, that is uh, some supplement of income for a young person. And I would have actually taken on uh, academia, which is my possibly my second love at that stage. So it was literally a hair's breadth between not staying on in Cambridge. Because I started teaching in that tutorial sense. And had I persisted, I would have got a job as a teacher there and maybe never come back. But uh, again, it was my mother who made the emotional call and made me come back. Uh, Apart from the fact that I happen to have the privilege of being the only male member amongst three brothers. So the threat of the Singhvi clan stopping to uh, seizing and not continuing if I did not come back and settle down here was also used in the emotional blackmail too. But be that as it may, uh, to come to your question more directly, when I came back, just before coming back, I had this uh, weird, the word only weird strikes me, fascination in my mind, purely in imagination of myself, that the most fantastic area of law to practice is excise law. It's a link to your corporate question. So I asked my father as to who's the best excise law in the country. And then and for a long time thereafter, uh, Mr. Ravindra Narayan and Jimmy Dalit Chanti was the best excise lawyer. So I telephoned him, gave him my credentials, which are very good academically, and said, look, I have to be there with you. I joined the first day there, and within eight to 12 weeks, I was completely disgusted and bored with the subject. So I started in corporate law, but again, as a litigator, and we, in those early days, it used to be Suri Sarabji, Ravindra and me, in many cases of excise uh, in the Delhi High Court. And uh, lastly, the reason I did not take to either corporate law, I mean, chamber lawyering never really interested me. I had seen, as I said, the sounds and smells of litigation lawyering around me. And uh, 
it's a very wide canvas and there's a public life link with it which my father had in a big way so the thought of being closeted in a chamber lawyering or a solicitor's firm never entered my mind but there was another problem since that was ruled out and since i had a genuine terror which i have till today of procedure i am genuinely terrified that if my clerk doesn't file the court fees in time or the service is not complete then the lawyer not for substantive law but for procedural law will be blamed by the client so i always eschewed uh, the path of a filing lawyer of a direct practitioner so it could be a solicitor's firm it could be a direct practitioner it could be a vakalat nama holder or it could be an advocate or broker not at the least because i looked down upon them and look up to something i believe a hard day's work is in any sphere but i was generally scared so i have to find this niche of purely a advocate a counsel and in delhi much worse than uh, mumbai and calcutta and even chennai there is no slot because you either have a senior or you have the advocate on record in those days they would think of me as an interloper that he is wanting to do something in a slot which doesn't exist in delhi so though that was the trying time because i was on my own i couldn't join a couple of two or three chambers which were full up so i kind of loitered with my father for two or three years uh it was two direct chambers i thought of but they were really full up overcrowded and then after that i just started doing what i could myself but never ever filed a vakalat nama in my name but the terror of procedure so again by process of elimination chamber lawyering solicitor lawyering vakalat nama filing brought me to this and that of course prolonged the period of uh, insecurity and uncertainty because at least vakalat nama and other forms of lawyering give you a hold on the client they give you a, a a certain perch in the beginning which is very necessary so it it has all kinds of insecurities in your mind but then ultimately it worked out well sir i mean uh, you know having spent so much time with you i had never thought of you being terrified of anything but again every time somebody speaks uh, to you one learns and your 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 terror of procedure is now uh, is noted uh, sir uh, just for a second i know it's not in a series of questions that i wanted to ask you but just for a second uh, did did do you think higher studies help in uh, especially a litigator uh, really actually i have not uh, at all in my mind thought of your question in a series you can ask me whatever you like so this is a conversation but you don't realize that this if it was not in your list i don't know that this is a very important question you asked me because yeah. a very simple nuance in the reply by all common sensical and logical arguments even today and possibly i would tell my children even today that a phd is of no value because it is a very academic um, area and in india and even elsewhere a doctorate lawyer first of all there are extremely few in in a real sense i mean you may have other forms of doctorate but people who have earned a doctorate spending 3 4 years abroad is very rare. and in the law practice it is common sense to think that it's a practical vocation just like medicine is a vocation you can't do tomes of study and learn it so that's a very practical thing about all vocations architecture again you can do a phd in architecture of course you can but you can't be a good architect necessarily so that thought persisted uh, and persists today so it defies logic but now when I, and, I, and, I, and i thought i had wasted those years but i came back i thought i would have started law practice much earlier but now very interesting twist to the tail when i think back in retrospect i think it actually did help me a lot and therefore those who are of an academic bent of mind who are having the same insecurities in me would do well to consider the benefit it gave me it may not give you in your case but it just did in my case whether by default or by chance uh when i came back a i was from a legal family my father was well known it gives you a good start but remember all starts only give you a push to make a fool of yourself in your third fourth case and it doesn't last long the second or third fourth case so you need to stand on your own feet but there became i realized this is much later i analyzed my scenario i realized not then that there became a presumption in the mind of the onlookers litigants fellow lawyers and most importantly judges that a chap who is from a good family whose family is known in law and who has an academic bent of mind and who has a phd must be deemed to be reasonably erudite and good now that's a deeming fiction there are all kinds of phds there are all kinds of people with phds who are not of necessarily good value but the fact that people thought so 
in a presumptive sort of way, and all presumptions, as you know, in law are rebuttable. So you start with a presumption in your favor, but your conduct can rebut it against yourself. So, but the presumption, I now look back, gave me a good fillip. Because when I stood up as a very young lawyer in court, as I said, without a vakalat and without really a client uh, or a set of lawyers briefing me in that sense, um, it helps to be able to regard it well. Because a lot of youngsters today don't realize it. Law is very much a matter of faith, trust, credibility. These are things which you don't learn in the law books or in the, uh, you know, the textbooks, statutes. But if you're, I'm not talking of law only in litigation, by the way, this is a caveat. Yeah. It, there's a human element, much more than any chamber law. And the human element is that you are interacting with a human, not a slotting machine. And humans tend to regard and trust you more than XYZ and XYZ more than ABC. So over time, if you discharge that trust with learning, with wisdom, with articulation, and also that if you say page 55, the judge knows that normally 99.9%, you're not pulling a fast one on him, that what you say is 55 has broadly got that one. This is what I think helped from my PhD. The re presumption, although wholly rebuttable, that he's a learned man or at least he's a sensible guy who has some knowledge who studied and he knows the subject. That's about it. Remember, in the end, this is a presumption for three to six months, your first 10 cases. You, you spoil it, you mess it up, the presumption never comes back. Got it, sir. Sir, I, I mean, you know, one of my uh, most uh, sort of awe-inspiring memories in, in, in chamber used to be that, you know, when I first started working, uh, every case that came to your chamber was iconic, you know, uh, be it the reliances of the world or the Tatas of the world. And every case that you pretty much fought, sir, uh, uh, used to be iconic. But I'm going to hold you to, to this. I want you to talk about in brief about your two, two most iconic. Uh, they could span your entire uh, time. See, in the you know, you know that it's a very difficult question. Yes, sir, it is. <laughs> like really, uh, in a sense, even amongst the iconic list, it's like choosing between two siblings or two babies or five babies or 25 that is, babies. That is my intention. <laughs> it's an unfair choice. Also, frankly, I've done now thousands of cases. Somebody already said the list of reported cases is some more than some 2,000. So, you know, one doesn't remember, one doesn't, one, and when you do something with passion and interest, a lot of them become your favorites. But as you say, now I'm being forced to choose. So now the choice again can be within one subject public law. So I can give you two best or three best. Choice could be across the board. I think it's better to make a choice across the board. Give it different. It, yeah. Again, the caveat, certainly this is not even an incomplete list. Certainly it is not even a subject-wise complete list. But with all the caveats, if you were to take three different areas altogether, one each, not two, but three. Three. Uh, the Karnataka case in public law, the Balco case constitution bench in commercial law and a special memory with DK Basu where I was appointed a amicus in the first five, seven years of my practice. And it's a major judgment on custodial death and custodial interrogation. But I started life with that way late in the 80s, late 80s, which is a few years after being enrolled. And it closed somewhere just as Thakur's time in 2000 with a different DK Basu. And I cherish that because it gave me a Philip as a young lawyer and also the judges in the judgment have recorded their appreciation of that. So these three stand out. And sir, uh, you know, I, I know, sir, again, uh, you know, uh, again, having spent some time with you in the morning, you're a very different person. Uh, pretty much at 10 a.m. You've, you've got into this zone of, of going into court and, uh, you know, ready for battle. And, you're, you're, and you're, you're, you're ready for battle on multiple accounts because you're in courtroom after courtroom. But sir, uh, you know, you have some easy cases and some difficult ones. What have, what have been the two instances where you've gone in thinking, I'm going to, this is a, this is a given order. And then you've had to fight for that order. And on the other hand, when you know the previous evening, this is a losing brief. Uh, and then you've gone ahead into the courtroom and you've turned it around. What are those two instances? Well, uh, the results, of course, one doesn't know when one goes in, but yes, there are many cases like that. And again, uh, Karnataka would qualify as a rather dismal start and a hopeful middle and then a successful result. Uh, Balco in the commercial sense was a very 
difficult case and I still extracted some things that very difficult to extract. And uh, Uttarakhand at the High Court level was to the Supreme Court with the main balance because I was opposed there by almost every top senior of the bar. So these were three very challenging of which I think Karnataka and Uttarakhand were the two most challenging times I had. Karnataka, I mean, so-called midnight hearing case. Correct, sir. Uh, Uttarakhand, sir, I think you were opposed by almost six uh, of the top. went in the beginning uh, with the sole decent hotel in Nenital office of the High Court. And it was a two or three day expectation and we stayed almost for a month with some, some gaps. And over time, as the matter was heard and deepened and when the judge went deep into it and made some prima facie observations in the law, in the court, asking questions, it seemed to suggest that he was getting a little hooked on my arguments. Then I had the Attorney General, then Attorney General opposing me, flying to Uttarakhand. I don't think the Attorney General has gone more than once or twice to Uttarakhand. Uh, then I had uh, Mr. Tushar Mehta, then an ASG. Then I had uh, for the private supporting people, those supporting the other side, respondents, the MLAs, Harish Salve, Arima Sundaram, then I had Nalin Kohli, I had Maninder Singh, so it was a challenge and it was also a highly political surcharged case. And there the spell of victory and the final victory was very, very sweet indeed. And all the hard work which we did, and certainly it is not more my work. All these things are possible with a team. So I have in every case different people working. And unless they deliver, I can't deliver. It's very, very clear. Uh, so uh, we work day and night, uh, all staying in the same hotel, by the way, because there is no other place. And then... Uh, it was, it was a very enjoyable experience to be able to get into with your sleeves rolled up. The same thing with the Karnataka. I was in Chandigarh. Now it's a published story. And uh, it was, I think, a Wednesday, if I remember. And uh, I finished my case in Chandigarh. It was generally going back to the hotel. That was the time, by the way, when there was a ban on flights from Chandigarh. Because Chandigarh airport was being renovated. So I was to take the night Shatabdi, which would get me in by 10.30 or something in the night. In the afternoon, just luckily after I finished my Chandigarh case, I got a frantic call from the Congress big weeks. So I said, even if I want to help you, how will I get there? So then I thought of it, not they, that there is an airport in Panchkula. Because it's not a question of lack of flights. It's a question of the airport in Chandigarh is shut down for renovation. So they managed to get, uh, and I must commend Mr. Surjewala, who managed to get an aircraft to which I took off, I think, at 3 o'clock. Meanwhile, I was able to instruct Devdath Kamath, who had worked with me in Uttarakhand, how to nuance the petition. And I told him, as soon as I come, I will then talk to you, but you must start applying to the court for an urgent immediate hearing, because otherwise there will uh, be a, uh, there will be no protest and there will be a postponement, because the governor there had given a longish time. Yes. And it just worked out, I think. The interesting tidbit is that when I came back, I went back to my home at around 6 and was in touch with the advocates on record till 9 o'clock with possibly no hope of the matter being missed it. But to the credit of the then Chief Justice, uh, and I told Kamath to keep his two people right in the registry standing, around 10 o'clock they started suggesting that it is likely to be listed but still permission has to be got and more than permission, the appropriate bench has to be found as to when they can sit and how they can sit. So I told Kamath around 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, I remember, that now it's 11. If it has to be heard, it will be heard between 10.30 and 12. So I think I will dress up and go near the court. Because if they suddenly sit, I won't be able to come. So I remember in my robes, which I left in the car, I went and had coffee in Taj Mansi Machan. It was the only place open in those days. Uh, sitting there, because that's about a kilometer away or two kilometers away from the courts. And true to form, just after 12, 12.30, we got the call. And from roughly 1, 1 1.30 till 5 in the morning. And why it was challenging and fascinating was that, which most people don't know, there was a great three-judge bench presided over by Justice Sikri, one of our finest, most patient judges. This is a sort of Ashok Bhushan, a very uh, patient person who likes to end. The present Chief Justice, again, a very uh, you know rounded person who wants to be into the matter. And by about 4 o'clock, I approximately, they had virtually put the file aside, politely declining to entertain more people. They actually picked up the file and put it down. And then I said something and I, you know, again developed the point, which made them pick up the point. And then Justice Bhushan turned and then he made observations to Justice Secret and all three of them 
at 5.30 and uh, or 5 o'clock or whatever the time was. And the final tidbit was that that morning being a Thursday, um, I left the court around 5 o'clock in the morning. And as it happened, my first case uh, on that Thursday morning at 10.30 was with a secret bench. <laughs> so I told him that you might think that uh, I'm like a bad penny who turns up at odd times. And he had a hearty laugh. But then the result of that was that again on the hearing, they gave a direction that on the Friday is what we wanted, but on Saturday, there shall be a vote of confidence. And I think that clinched it. Because from that Wednesday night, Thursday morning, it went to the Friday. And from the Friday, it went to the Saturday. Thursday was the gap day in between. But it was a fascinating experience. And, you know, it's not very good for health because it makes the adrenaline run very fast. But it's very enjoyable, especially in retrospect. Sir, I mean, yeah, again, uh, you know, one of my abiding memories has been that, you know, you don't sleep at all. And you catch these small naps that manage, that you manage somehow, you know, in the car or in between. And, 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 it's, and you just, it seems like you're always doing a lot of things, which is something that we've all learned. Uh, uh, your, your, your legend as it comes to multitasking. Sir, uh, you didn't talk about Balco at all. I, I just wanted to talk about Balco yeah. because it's commercial. Oh. The reason why Balco, which is a pure commercial case, was a losing case because it was well known that the Balco bench was set up to overrule Bhatia. Bhatia was a much stigmatized judgment. Now, I was, you don't choose your client, you don't judge your client. You don't say, I will take a brief because I find your brief better and the other brief bad. You don't do it like that. So, my client was the one which was supporting Bhatia. So, we knew we were doomed. The reason why it's called fascinating is because it is in such cases that your creativity can have a play. Uh, this will require some technical explanation, otherwise your viewers won't understand. But no, no, please, sir. The main, point, the main point was that whether you can at all have recourse to an Indian court in an international arbitrage. Now, cutting a long story short, the whole point of Bhatia was that it said yes in a wider sense than it should. Now, I could not ask for the Bhatia regime to be continued or upheld in the Balkan. It's a constitutional bench, remember. So when I argue, I said, yes, Bhatia should be overruled because of overbreadth. But the core of Bhatia, you have to consider. The core of Bhatia is that if A and B are litigating in London, in international arbitration, the venue is London. And the subject matter of the dispute, and I, this has led to much amusement by the bench. I said, I'm from Rajasthan. is a fort in Rajasthan. And while they're litigating there, one of the parties threatens to sell the fort or alienate the fort or mortgage the fort or whatever, give it away. If your law is correct, then it will mean that he, the other chap, A, has to go only to an English court or to an um, uh, English arbitration, London-based arbitration for an interim order, which will not be sustained because the interim order by an arbitrator from London or even a court of London can be flouted with impunity in India. So I said, what is the remedy in the interim to preserve the subject matter of arbitration? To that extent, give me recourse in India. Because Bhatia actually intended that, but Bhatia was misapplied to mean all kinds of states. I said Bhatia should be read to mean only an interim protection, protective stay when there is a foreign-based arbitration to protect the subject matter of the arbitration, suppose the ship of the goods or the Ford example. The court, you'll be surprised, was very moved by that and they almost came to an inch of this. But ultimately they said that this will be the thin end of the wedge which will open the whole thing again. So they declined, but in the process of argument, I added a third nuance in which I succeeded. I said, in the unlikely event that your lordship don't agree with my submission that you should allow interim state to operate to that narrow extent, then your lordship should make Balco apply prospectively for the simple reason that this is the list of cases I'm handing over, which is the progeny of Bhatia. That's a phrase used by me in the court. Bhatia was whatever, six, seven, eight years earlier. From then to today, these many high courts and even the Supreme Court has followed Bhatia. Today, you may or may not overrule Bhatia, but if you are overruling Bhatia after six, seven years, then all transactions in between will be unsettled and will create chaos and uncertainty. So you can declare that our law in Balco, if it goes against me, that is my point of view, shall operate from after the date of Balco. I think personally, this is a theory of realism, and the judges are influenced by your argument on X. They don't give you the X relief, but they give you the Y relief sometimes. So the influence is from X. So I think they were influenced by the court argument, but they gave me relief to the extent beyond my beyond my beyond my request. 
they said it will apply not only prospectively, they said it will apply, that means the new law will start applying only to arbitration agreements entered into after the date of the Balco judgment, right. which is a much more in the same direction than the relief I had asked for. So till today, Bhatia applies. Every case, to Balco, how many years old? I don't know. It was 2012. 2012. 12. 12. 12. Eight years. Agreements of arbitration well prior to uh, uh, that date will still continue to apply Bhatia. So in a sense, we succeeded in yeah. the actual result for individuals, although the law, I think rightly, was set right. Sir, uh, you know, it's, it is a tough time. Eh? You know, the profession is seeing a change. Uh, what would you tell uh, young lawyers graduating, well, this year and, and the next year? What, what advice would you give them? That sounds very didactic and pompous. Today's young people, I have had the privilege of sitting on many selection boards and chairing them. I have always said openly that the people we interview are far brighter than the interviewers. So today, these people, people, young people don't require that kind of sermonizing. They know a lot. All I would say is that uh, there is no substitute for hard work. As they say, there's a lot of substitute for Harvard, but not for hard work. And uh, you should not, there are, of course, merit is not the best consideration. India has all kinds of aberrations. But you should have faith in the system that if there is true merit and persistence and hard work, there is a large acceptance of it. Don't be cynical in thinking that everybody acts on non-merit and you are going to be by the wayside. So I think that positivity and hope has to be there. And ultimately, when you come into the trenches, when you stand before a judge, the title of my latest book is From the Trenches, uh, then you must realize that the only thing with you is, as you say, yourself, your wits and your preparation the previous night. There's nothing else. Your friend doesn't matter, your connection doesn't matter, your family doesn't matter. All that matters is the confidence which it gives you when you know that you're well prepared. And then, of course, experience helps over time. So I think that positive approach is important. Of course, other things are all important. But I said, you must have credibility. You must never try fast ones because fast ones work for one, two, three times. And you are cynical because you think that it's working for many people. But actually, it's not. In the short or the semi medium term, also it doesn't. Because judges understand, lawyers understand that you can't be trusted. And that never, I'm not talking again and again, of course, from the litigating side of it. It's a different uh, test which will apply in the corporate side. So okay. I think these are the basic things you have to keep out, watch out for. So, you know, uh, you get briefed from, I mean, you've pretty much been briefed. Uh, uh, throughout your litigation career and having interacted with so many lawyers who come to brief you, um, you know, the young ones and, and people who've spent a little bit of time in, in this world, uh, what would you say to them? How can they do a little bit better? How can they become better briefing counsel? Um, how could they uh, help senior advocates? The, the rest I've answered in the previous question, but with the specific reference to uh, this part of the briefing counsel, Sir. I mean, they should. I think. Uh, Everything is an art in law, if you start paying attention to details. Otherwise, everything is just general. But if you start paying attention, I think to be briefed by a good briefer, it doesn't matter whether he's one day old, 10 years old, or even a senior counsel briefing you. A lot of seniors brief us, elder seniors. So, in all of that, I think it's a pleasure to be briefed by somebody who knows the turning point. And that comes... See, it's both a way of impressing people. You're a young person. When you have that grip, on every case turns on two, three, maximum five points. If it doesn't, the turning, the, 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 the key in the joints, the movement in the joints, only in three points, four points, five points. If it doesn't turn, turn means to go this way or that way. If it doesn't turn on these three, four, five points, that means it's not going to turn at all. That means it's a black and white case. Now, those three points are the same are the ones which you've studied it properly and got them, then you have to be ready for those answers in the briefing. And then it's a pleasure Then I immediately find when 10 unknown people come to brief you. Somebody from Bombay, somebody in the same case, some big cases. By two or three questions, you can make out that this guy knows the nuts and bolts. And then over time on your own, you start relying more on that person because he's in sync with the way I know I have to present. And then I know that this is what will make the case turn. So that is my advice to briefers. It's a great opportunity to impress your boss. 
in the firm. It's a great opportunity to even great opportunity to impress the client. It's a great opportunity to impress your senior. And ultimately, above all, it is the greatest opportunity to make you realize in a litigating career, if you choose, this is how you can be a good counsel because you are understanding the turning points. That's very, very pointed advice. Thank you, sir. So uh, while you're also interacting with briefing counsel, uh, there is a lot of interaction that you have with the lawyers that are the in-house counsel, the lawyers that represent the corporates. They're also part of that briefing. Um, you know, I understand they are not sort of with you in court, sort of standing next to you, but they are sort of in your chamber. They, they spend a lot of time with you. Uh, uh, in, in my time, what you call the in-house counsel, sir. unfortunately, a very marginal and degraded role. And I've had the privilege in my younger years to speak at the association of all in-house counsel across the country, which had like 100 companies in-house counsel form an association. And they asked me to address And I said, I always say that you people should stand up for your rights. In America, the standing counsel, we call the general counsel and the in-house counsel, right. is virtually a terror for every other department of the company. The company cannot sneeze unless they get a clearance from that legal department. For long, and I'm speaking in the past deliberately, the Indian standing council stature was of a walkover carpet situation, which is very sad. There are some very bright, good people out there, but they were not given importance by other departments of the company and by their own bosses. And there was excessive reliance. Now, this all I spoke in the past tense, but the good thing is that for the last seven, eight years or 10 years, this has changed radically. So the first point is it's very good for that class. Number two, the remunerations and the salaries have improved considerably in yes. the announcement. Yes. Again, it changed completely and you are a recruiter in many different ways and you know what I mean. Yes. The same from my time and now. Third, uh, today you'll be surprised that some top corporates, I'm talking of the first three top of India, for example, say that today foreign law firms are prepared to become your in-house counsel. There is more work in the top firms to be in-house counsel than to run a law firm. Yes. The returns are more. So, you know, a top law firm in India can sustain 30, 40, 50 in-house counsel mm -hmm. and efficiently manage even a firm of 100. That's bigger than a law firm outside. Now, this is the, the structural part. On the individual part, I think, again, the in-house counsel at various levels have ceded territory. They've allowed themselves to become managers. Mm -hmm. That's their fault. Today, if you're conscious of the fact that you are a very special breed who is looked on with awe and respect in other jurisdictions. So if you hone your skill, which you took on as a law student and a law person and keep to the substantive law, keep yourself glued on and be the interactive uh, person who's in court who understands the point, who reads up, then you are a very powerful body. According to me, you are more powerful than solicitors and direct practitioners. So I think this is what the advice to younger in-house people is. That they can be heading and advising major operations in major companies who today choose to have a direct link between those counsel and senior counsel. Cutting off the intermediary two levels. A direct practitioner and a solicitor's firm. There is no reason why they need it every time. And I think that's a great opportunity. I find generally that the in-house counsel are more corporate oriented and they must become more litigation oriented. And that will help both their careers and also advance their whole breed and genre of in-house counsel. Sir, uh, also something that I had read during uh, my time with you, uh, a large part of your uh, thesis was also covered the issue of pendency in India. And I know that you do feel deeply about it that you know this is an issue that needs to be solved and this is something that we need to tackle. Uh, administration of justice and reforms in the administration of justice has been a favorite topic for over 20 years. Yes, sir. I must have spoken on it at least 20 times in great detail globally, internationally, in India, universities, law seminars, everywhere. However, that was not the subject matter of my thesis at all. My thesis was on substantive constitutional law. Uh, emergency powers, a comparative perspective. But this subject has interested me. I always believe that uh, the problem is much smaller than we tend to think when we think of a staggering figure of 3.5 crore. We get disheartened and disillusioned on the challenge of beating the backlog or the battle of the bulge, as they call it. 
but actually by some 10, 12 very, very simple, in fact, remarkably simple panaceas. This can be tackled and solved. You need to only decide those 10 items, pursue them and implement them diligently without change for five years, and the numbers will start showing a difference. The tragedy of India is that we don't take care of the small things. We don't take care of doing something uninterruptedly for five years. We have too many mid-course corrections. Too many people at different times want to leave their own imprint and don't have a continuity. Otherwise, I think the areas problem is actually like a house of cards, pack of cards, which can collapse if attacked properly. And I've written on it, the article in the public domain. Yes, I don't speak about it, but uh, I, I believe I'm a bit of a specialist in this. And I am struck by the tragedy that these steps have not been taken. Um, so much so that I, 10 years ago, recommended that at least it should be a taught subject. And I've said that in every time I've spoken. But now, I'm happy to note that taking my advice, uh, many law universities are starting reforms in the administration of justice as a taught subject. Because you can learn all the substantive law you like, you can learn all the procedural law you like. But unless you know the infrastructure and the system in which this whole thing operates, you are being very academic and ivory towerish. Because the real thing gets stuck in these situations, which is what you must also be aware of. Sir, you've always been a gadget freak. It's something that has always excited you. you you've loved using new gadgets. Uh, anything new that you suggest or or that you think that the courts must adopt uh, to, to, to sort of help them along this kind of... At a personal level, I am being called publicly at a personal level a uh, gizmo crazy, but not gizmo savvy. That's my own but description. You're fairly savvy. You're being... Uh, now, I think for my age and generation, I'm well, well above average. But my fascination and passion for gadgets far exceeds my savviness. I would like to say that it's best for people, especially of my kind, to just perfect themselves in what they need. It's no point being gadget savvy in, you know, very, very, very highly sophisticated exercise of gadgetry, which you may be able to handle, which I don't need. So I am very happy because I can write my articles. I can do Zoom. I can do searches. I can seek information. I can reply to my emails. For about seven, eight years, I've never seen a laptop. The iPad is my Bible. And that and the mobile phone, I can do most things which work for me. Now, it's possible that for another person, a little variation will work. And it's the simplest thing to get used to. So I use it purely as a slave. Though I am gizmo crazy in the sense of wanting new gadgets every time. But ultimately, my use is very much to put it to use as a slave for what it does for me. And I'm quite happy that uh, it has worked for me. Uh, I wrote an article the other day in the Indian Express about three weeks ago about how uh, the courts should be using virtual lawyering even after we come back to the normal normal. You see, post lockdown is not normal, post lockdown is semi normal. Yes, sir. Semi normal is normal normal. So, thereafter, the court should have a system whereby even in normal normal after six months or a year, at least 33% cases should be done the way we are doing now. And there's no reason why it can't be. And sir, do you think this is uh, going to be viable? Uh, you know, is this going to be sustainable? It's actually the most viable, the most sustainable. You see, just think, think if in 19th May, the lockdown is out. Do you think hordes and thousands of lawyers will go to the high court? Do you think you will go to the high court to argue matter? Do you think I will go to the Supreme Court? People can't have 3,000 people, 5,000 people, same place, same premises, staff, clerks, drivers, lawyers, everybody. So, uh, this is the way out now. I don't see any problem. I think it's we are talking of petty things that judges should not even be bothered about. The government should provide it. 30 crore, 50 crore, 70 crore. What is it to revamp the entire capacity of the Supreme Court conferencing by video? I was asked the other day, I found judges coming and sitting together. When I'm arguing, the judges are sitting physically together. Okay. So, uh, there is no system by which they want to confer. They can mute it, confer amongst themselves, and then have a sound. Now, that's a very silly thing, I thought. Uh, there is no reason why technology cannot have that simple software. If it costs money, the jolly well government has to provide it. Here is the irony of the Supreme Court giving PIL directions every day to do this and that for COVID. And they have not got sufficient manpower infrastructure. 
Same for high courts. And this same paradigm applies down the line. There could be a very small category of rural India. Today, remember, most of India is urban. And what is not urban is rurban. Rurban is pretty much urban. Yeah. So those two areas, there is only an excuse. A lot of technology is there. People know how to use it. According to me, in a litigation, there is always one side which wants delay and obstruction. There will always be one side which wants delay and obstruction. Correct. They are the ones who make the excuses. We can't do this, we can't do that. Once you have made a set of rules, take for example my article that I said that if the Supreme Court was to have, which has 35 judges, was to have, say, seven benches comprising 15 judges, sitting and doing all 10 year plus old cases by virtual lawyering. And you issue a notification that we are starting this. And if you don't appear, you don't appear at your own risk and cost. You decide it. You will be attacking a whole skirt. And the other balance, 15 can sit in seven benches, dealing with the current filings under continuing strict filing guidelines, which I support. Because that way the kachra doesn't get filed. But keeping that, why should lack of technology, internet, uh, you know, staff, connectivity, why should this be an issue at all? We can't consider ourselves to be a superpower in every which way uh, or aspiring to be close to one and then, you know, cry about these small things. Okay. Understood, sir. And I think it will also help uh, the issue of pendency because, you know, cases will get smaller and time bound. Uh, sir, I uh, wanted to ask, uh, uh, you have been, obviously, sir, you've been, you know, sort of in, in the forefront of sort of changing so many acts, changing so many laws, Balko, you exam the example that you gave. Is there a current law, sir, that you are currently appearing in that you feel that desperately needs an overhaul? It's not a current law. It's the one of the oldest laws. And everybody agrees it has to be changed. It should be changed. But there is no will, power, methodology, and commitment to do it. Labor laws of India. Labor laws of India, which doesn't mean only the Industrial Disputes Act. It means seven, eight acts. Yes, sir. There is a large consensus even amongst labor that should be changed. Much more. So you can't talk of, you know, SEZs, China, industry coming back. You have to address. This is the third year. We had the first generation reforms in 1990. We may have had it's a liberalization reform. We may have had tariff reforms later on. But we haven't had third generation reforms. Third generation reforms have to start with labor law. Without that, all this make in India, manufacturing, SEZ, luring the Japanese companies and uh, you know, catching the American capital will just not happen. It starts with that labor. Two things. And so recently there are states talking about suspending labor laws for a few years. That's, it goes... that's a little different from what I just talked about, reform of labor laws. Reform is different. That, of course, is, a, I think, a welcome measure. So, you know, uh, during COVID, you've lost so much time and wealth. So if you start strictly applying, you know, for example, minimum wages, there may be well a problem because the worker is happy to get non-minimum wages so long as he has employment. And the employer, maybe even if he wants, he cannot do it. So those strict adherences, or for that matter, you know, you can't work more than eight hours. These are things which are, right? that's a very limited temporary suspension. We're talking of fundamental reform. Understood, sir. Sir, uh, you know, recently, and this is, you know, very, uh, has been, more more in the last few years than, than in the past, the constitution has become a rallying point for civil society. Uh, how important do you rate this development and what do you think citizens can better do to promote the principles set out in the constitution? Well, I think I genuinely believe that the constitution has to be the Gita, the Bible. They will accept the basic structure doctrine which will render a constitutional amendment also unconstitutional. Constitution should be and is the best secular book of India. So that it is a rallying point should not be something surprising or new. It, I believe, must be. And I believe nothing else should rally us as much as the Constitution. Now, having said that in the general sense, why is it and what is it that you rally around? There is the constitutional text and then there is the constitutional spirit. But along with these two, there is the constitutional gap. As somebody said, constitutional silences are more evocative and eloquent than the constitutional text. So we have to understand the idea of our constitution. We have to understand the very spirit underlying it. And once you start understanding that and a citizen rallies around it, I think that's the best thing which can happen. 
I would support it completely. So the ringing words of fraternity, secularism, uh, justice for all, equality, these are words which resonate right through. And then your willpower to stand up, your persistence to make a point. I mean, I, I remember the black case which I did for Navi Chandra. Now, which person except somebody you call an eccentric, and I called him that, would say that I went to Bhopal to my factory and one day I started flying a flag and a guy came and gave me notice the local administration and said his factory is in Bhopal. Mm. Said you, I'm going to prosecute him because you flew the flag. So he asked him, he said, how, how is it that I can fly a Pakistani flag okay. and not fly the flag? And from that persistence and idea, now that went to the constitution, that went to the high court, that came to me, I argued it, etc., etc. The whole story goes on, but that is the constitutional spirit as an example I'm giving. That's how the spirit starts. And when the spirit starts, it goes up. How was Keshwar and the Bharati settled? They were settled by some landowner in Kerala saying, look, just so what, you have an amendment in the ninth century, so what? You can't take away it like this. The amendment itself violates the constitution. So, And then, of course, you need a Palkiwan to build up the doctrine. So, But the point is, this is the thought process which must be fearless, which must be clear, and which must be um, forever innovative, trying to explore by stretching the boundaries of the constitution. And that inquisitive spirit is frequently lacking, sometimes flagging, sometimes diminished, frequently suppressed, but it is there. And you have to find it and then convert it into a voice. So that is for the citizens. What role do you see uh, lawyers playing in this society? And what can we do to advance this? This is the same. It's, it, they are the vanguard. If there is a pool and you have a, a triangle-shaped pool, the lawyers are the pointed, jagged end of the triangle in the front. The citizenry has to be behind them. The client has to be behind them. But in this entire answer I gave just now, at the vanguard, are fearless, straightforward lawyers who have, first of all, have to have the spirit, not for publicity, not for just, you know, picking up a marginal issue that today it will give me publicity if I find out how many people are here and file a PI. Not that approach. That this is a real point. Starting with that inquisitive, fearless spirit to researching and hardworking it, which is lacking frequently. Then having the persistence to carry it through. There is no better class of people who can do it. And the fact that you are uniquely endowed, in fact, uniquely permitted alone to do it should be exploited by you, but not in the sometimes in the various ways when you find Pesa versus litigation, publicity interest litigation, personal interest litigation, but genuinely interested, researched, hard work, hardwired law, which will always push the constitutional boundaries ahead. But I'm fairly conscious that you had told me 45 minutes, hopefully. Uh, and yes. so you can do a little bit I more. Have five minutes yes. ahead. I, I mean, most of the questions that I genuinely wanted to cover in this conversation, I have covered. But if I have a moment, I will ask you, sir. I remember once you had once posted, you have 10,000 songs in your uh, in your, in your <laughs> iPod back then. Uh, and you, you, you were a big no, fan. You're wrong. You got the figure wrong. I'm a, I love Bollywood music. Yes. 10,000, too much I wouldn't be able to, but I have a fair number. Probably. No, sir, it was 10,000 back then, I remember. <laughs> I don't know, I had that, that's a general kind of iPod presented to me with a pre yeah. I think I've lost. <laughs> but I have a fair number of thousand songs plus, which is a lot. And right. you know, turn to sometimes once in a while. And uh, what is worse, I have expanded from being a bathroom singer to trying my own luck on and off. Uh, so, but you know, these are enjoyable pastimes, I enjoy them, but they need persistence. And that's where the thing flags. So these are my semi-retirement plans. Let us see. And sir, on the movie front, you used to be an avid movie watcher whenever you got time. Back then it was very little. I, still, I'm only the mode has changed. I used to go religiously on a Friday and a Saturday. Uh, sorry, Friday or a Saturday uh, to a film, almost uh, religiously done. But now, obviously, it has become more uh, the channel bound from Apple TV. To there are so many options now. The only problem is that I watch very little television otherwise. I've 
for a person who interacts so much with the media, I probably watch less than half an hour of television. But I more than make up for this addiction, call it, or at least a weakness for an occasional and sometimes it gets frequent uh, predilection for action pillars. That's the only thing which sometimes carries me late in the night. Only that genre, only that kind, but quality kind, good kind. And then, you know, that's a waste of time, but it's also very enjoyable. It's therapeutic in many ways. But on the action figure side, there is a new TV series called Jack Ryan, which is very interesting. I've already watched it. I've already seen it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and sir, uh, I remember you used to always visit uh, extraordinarily exotic locations for, for summer vacations. Uh, Brazil and Peru I, stand out. I uh, can't claim exotic, but yes, two or three principles stand out. Uh, I am proud that possibly now for 30 years, I have not continuously touched wood. Never missed a summer vacation. In the old days, it used to be two of us and four weeks. Then became slowly three and a half, then three. And now I think you can't handle more than two and a half weeks. And from two people, it became three, then four, then six, and now eight. Mm -hmm. So my grandchildren. Yeah. So eight people, two and a half weeks, religiously. Uh, somewhere at the end of the first week of June and back in the last week of June. And I think to keep that record up is very, very uh, creditable and uh, it's also very uh, uh, heartening. I just hope that uh, God and circumstance allow me to do it. I also believe that those who do not take their holidays seriously cannot really take their work seriously. It doesn't mean that uh, the holidays have to be long, excessive, uh, you know, over flamboyant. But yes, you must keep that time away. Thirdly, I have I am now inclined to the principle that you must take shorter and more frequent holidays if you can. Now it's not always easy because your interests have to match with your spouses and other women. But to the extent possible, I classify my year into four broad blocks: the holy, the summer, the winter Diwali and the Shara, and the winter winter, the Christmas time. So to the extent you can get a week off once or two weeks off another time. I think that should be, and it is becoming increasingly my paradigm, not four times a year, but two to three times. And I think that is the new paradigm, unlike the old one, which was a longish summer vacation. And last but not this is a principle I made, but it has now been broken in the last two or three years because with young grandchildren, sometimes you go to the easy place. But the principle I made in almost 25 of the 30 years is life is short, the world is too big, so don't repeat a place. That's the closest you get to your exotic. It's not exotic, but it's different. It's different. So from New Zealand to Machu Picchu, to the Amazon forest, to Iguazu Falls, and of course to my only com incomplete education remains in Africa, uh, where South Africa cannot be really called Africa, which I have done. But right from Egypt downwards, as they say, inshallah, in the not too distant future. The rest of the different cultures and climates, I've pretty much done a lot. But of course, Antarctic remains, most of Africa remains, and uh, not enough of South America. They're the areas I'd like to come to. But remember, these are maybe my wishes, but with disparate family members of disparate ages, it's not always a practical thing to plan like that. I, uh, I remember, sir, having conversations with you when you were in uh, Machu Picchu, almost threatening to bring you back, but I'm glad that it did, that matter did not rectify and you managed to have your entire holiday. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm extraordinarily grateful for your time, uh, your indulgence and uh, your candor uh, in this uh, conversation. So thank you very much. Um, sir, if you would like to sign off with something, we'd be, I'd be very grateful. Well, it's been a very nice interview. It brings back memories. I think uh, everybody's experience and life journey is different. I think ultimately what matters for all lawyers, which apparently seems to be a major audience, uh, to be or already lawyers, is to have faith and to try and practice Rudyard Kipling's gift, to give that minute every second of its worth and not regret what you cannot achieve, not lament over what is incomplete and enjoy whether it is 30 seconds of that one minute, 45 seconds or 60 seconds. Enjoy it 
and everything else will take care of itself. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.